Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In a recent video, I talked about some of the flaws in the IPCC 1.5 report. Specifically, the premise of the report is that we're one degree Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures at the moment. And the pre-industrial is defined as the temperature average between 1850 and 1900. The problem is that, as I discussed in my previous video, is that the initial baseline of the IPCC reports from years ago considered pre-industrial to be the year 1750. So the temperature from 1750 up until the average temperature between 1850 and 1900, the temperature rose anywhere from 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 degrees. I've seen as high as 0 0.3 degrees. So using the original baseline, we're actually 1.2 to 1.3 degrees above pre-industrial. Now global average temperatures are rising roughly 0 0.25 degrees Celsius per decade. So what this means is that within a decade, we really go past the 1.5 degree temperature mark relative to pre-industrial. And another two de subsequent decades would add another 0 0.5 degrees, bringing us up to the two degree guardrail. So a total of 30 years for that. The problem is, is that climate change is accelerating rapidly and we're rapidly losing sea ice and snow cover in the Arctic, making it much darker, and the jet streams are distorted, etc. We're we're basically things are all things are accelerating very quickly. There's there's tremendous feedbacks in the climate system, and in this video, I'm going to discuss uh, what these main feedbacks are, and I don't feel that these are adequately covered in the latest IPCC 1.5 report. So what we have here is this um, basically, if you Google, tipping elements, the Achilles heel of the Earth system. Okay, so what these tipping elements, it's basically complex system dynamics. So there's generally a threshold. As long as you're below this threshold, things can be fairly linear. But when you go above this threshold, you suddenly can get a, a tipping point or a break in the system where the system behavior goes from one state to another state. So a good example is think of a canoe tipping. You, you go to a certain range of tipping and the canoe can right itself, but you reach this sudden point and the canoe will just tip right over. Or you bend a stick and then take the pressure off. Bend it a bit more, take the pressure off. You reach a certain point where it snaps. Or a temperature change, for example, near um, the freezing point. You know, you have a liquid, liquid water, you lower the temperature, lower the temperature, you know, you're, you're a fraction of a degree above the freezing point and it's still liquid, but you reach that freezing point and the, the, the phase changes, you get a, a state change. So these are all examples of, of tipping points. Um, so have a look at this. This is the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. They have a good discussion here on tipping elements, um, which are the Achilles heel of the climate system. So let's have a look at these. Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna talk about mostly the cryosphere, cryospheric entities. So we've got the Basically, the Arctic sea ice is rapidly going, and the Arctic uh, ice, ice being very, being white, has a high albedo or reflectance, reflects a lot of the incoming sunlight. As the ice is decreasing to smaller and smaller areas, then it's reflecting less and less light in the summers. So the Arctic is becoming darker, and it's absorbing a lot more of that sunlight. So the Arctic is heating up extremely rapidly. 
course, Greenland ice sheet is up there. Right now, the center of cold is roughly near the North Pole, but offset towards Greenland because Greenland extends quite far south. When there's no Arctic sea ice, the center of cold will be the center of Greenland, which is at 73 degrees north latitude. So that represents a shift of the center of cold from the North Pole, near the North Pole, to of 17 degrees down to the center of Greenland. We also have uh, methane in the form of, it's in the permafrost, and this is a vast area of permafrost, the Udoma permafrost. We have the methane in the clathrates on the seafloor, and we also have the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet and the East Antarctic ice sheets. Not shown on here is the glaciers of the world. Now, here's the jet streams, and there's other tipping points in the circulation patterns. The jet stream becoming wavier, making regions, for example, the southwest of North America turning into desert. The monsoon behavior can be changed. The circulation patterns can then change the uh, ocean circulation. So it's not just the air circulation changing, it's the ocean circulation. It's the way that heat is transported from the equator to the poles is changing. So the monsoons um, around the world can change and the El Nino, we can get more or less a, a permanent El Nino type state. So I'll be talking about that in a subsequent video. And then of course the biosphere components, the effects of the of climate change uh, tipping, for example, the Amazon rainforest. Um, and you know, the loss of rainforest, climates change, so you wouldn't get the trees growing back. The trees get basically drought, trees dry out, soils dry out susceptible to fires. When that destroys the forest, you don't get forest growing back. You would get savanna or grasslands growing back if the climate has shifted. The coral reefs, of course, are under great stress. The boreal forests are a huge sink of carbon, and we're getting more and more fires in those, and uh, those, those forests are very stressed. And then, of course, the phytoplankton, the marine biological carbon pump, removes huge amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere. But with less and less, with, with warmer and warmer oceans, more and more stratification, less nutrients at the surface, leading to less phytoplankton, less carbon removed from the atmosphere. So a warming ocean, a stressed and reduced carbon sink in the ocean. So I'll be talking about all of these things, um, but let's talk about, let's focus on the, on the um, cryosphere one. So the, of course, I've talked lots about the melting of the Arctic sea ice, and also that really when the ice, sea ice is gone, uh, an Arctic is much, much warmer, and we get increased rates of ice loss from Greenland, um, as the sea level rises, that impacts, and, and the sea's warming around Antarctica. It undercuts the ice sheets on Antarctica, the West Antarctic ice sheet, the East Antarctic ice sheet threatened. The melting of the permafrost, the thawing of the permafrost, um, the Edoma Peninsula, huge amounts of, of uh, organic material tied up in the permafrost. When it, th when it thaws, the bacteria, bacteria starts breaking down the organic matter, producing CO2 and methane, and or methane, depending on the amount of available oxygen. And methane emissions from the seafloor. So these are the tipping points that I'm going to focus on in this video. So let's start with a map of the Arctic Ocean here. Okay, the Arctic region, you can see these are the shallow continental shelves circumventing the Arctic. Um, we have the Yodoma is up in this region. The, the, okay, so there, there's huge amounts of organic material tied up in the frozen grand, ground on the land and also in the sediments on the seafloor. Um, and that's true for that's the case all the way around on these continental shells. But this is, the, this is a vast area that is considered to have most of the 
methane. Of course, Greenland is sitting here, and when there's no sea ice, the only cold part of Greenland, well, the only cold part will be Greenland. The center of Greenland is about 73 degrees north, whereas so right now at the North Pole, um, the, the center of cold w wouldn't be here. It'll be shifted towards Greenland, but with no sea ice, it'll be right on Greenland. So that represents, not only are the jet streams slowing and becoming wavier, leading to extreme weather event, but the whole jet streams are likely to shift in a world without sea ice. This is a, um, another map showing the bathymetry, and you can see the scale here. So these areas here, these vast continental shells, the water is only, mostly it's between, it's less than 100 meters deep. 100 meters, 50 meters, and this is significant because when you get bubbles of methane coming up from the sediments on the seafloor, and according to Peter Wadhams, the temperature, the water temperature is five to seven degrees warmer on the uh, seafloor now than it used to be, and this is sawing out the sediment, and we can get methane bubbles coming up, and they just go right through the, through the water column. Most of the bubbles make it to the surface because the water is so shallow and they go into the, the atmosphere. Okay, so now Greenland. This is an image of Greenland, different field research stations that have been, this is the 2014 Greenland field research, the National Science Foundation, NASA, NOAA, different stations and different parts on Greenland where work's being done. This image shows the thickness of the ice on Greenland. So this is about 3.36 kilometers, the, the red areas, and it shows you, you know, the thickest ice is in the central regions. This is where some of the ice cores have been done because the thicker the ice, the deeper the ice core extracted will be and that gives you a time we go back about about uh, 100 and uh, 140,000 years or so in the thickest parts in Antarctica it's 800,000 years approaching a million years back because the ice is that much thicker there um, this is another image showing the ice thickness in meters so over three kilometers, three and a half kilometers is the thickest ice, you know, and uh, thinning as you get over to the, to the uh, edges. Now, what happens when there's no ice left in Greenland? Then this is what the um, topography, this is what the rocks look like underneath Greenland. So what you can see is, you can see that these central areas here are well below sea level. And there's lots of areas along the coastline that are well below sea level that are presently covered by the, the ice sheet. Okay, so what this means is that you don't just get melting of the ice from above. You don't just get calving at the coastlines. You also get hot water, ocean water, warm ocean water going underneath, undercutting and melting the ice from below. You get a similar thing in Antarctica. So here we have Antarctica. Um, this is a topographic map of Antarctica and you can see the, um, these are some selected locations of peaks, local peaks. Um, this is the, uh, it goes up to almost 5,000 meters, the, um, the mountains here. And this is the uh, thickness um, these, are, these are the elevation readings of, of various locations. This is Vostok, where one of the, the, the uh, deepest, um, one of the longest ice cores was extracted. So there's lots of areas along West Antarctic that are under threat, and it turns out that East Antarctica is not as stable as we initially thought. So this is the ice thickness, four and a half thousand meters or so. And this is the, these are some of the melt rates of around Antarctica. So this is the loss in 100 gigatons per year, calving versus melt. So you can see that Antarctica